Welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan in our Walking in the Word series. This is Chaplain Greg. And uh, if you are enjoying this series, I uh, ask that you please like and subscribe and uh, share this video with other people. Post some comments. Love to hear what you're thinking about it. Uh, maybe you disagree with some things I'm saying. I'd love to have some interaction there. And you can always email me at wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com. So, welcome to the New Testament. Yeah, we've it's taken a while, hasn't it? We've uh, gone through the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament, and uh, we've uh, been through a lot of history. We've been through a lot of poetry. We've we've heard an awful lot of prophets talk about stuff. But uh, boy, oh boy, we've made it to the New Testament. And uh, last week we talked about the time in between the last time, the last book written in the Old Testament, which is Malachi, up until. The time of Jesus. So, as we said last week, the Romans are in control. Uh, they control everything. Herod is king, but he doesn't have a lot of power. Think of it more like as a mafia mob boss. He wasn't a good guy. He was not a good guy in any way, shape, or form. Um, he made himself rich off of the backs of the people in Israel. Um, but after he dies, and this is when Jesus was still a boy living in Egypt, and we'll talk about that when we get to Matthew, um, Israel's divided between his three sons. So this is Herod. Herod dies while Jesus is still a boy in Egypt, and he has three sons. Arch Archelaus, who has Judea. Antipas, who has Galilee and the Transjordan area. And then Philip, who has the northern area the Decapolis, Caesarea, and Philippi. Okay, Caesarea, Philippi. So his three sons take over as co-mafia bosses, so to speak. They're not in charge. The Romans are in charge. But they keep things in order. They make a lot of money off of the people's backs. You know, it's a, it's a good situation for them. So the Jewish leaders are coming into this age, and the Jewish leaders are split amongst several different factions. Like any good religion, there are multiple factions and multiple expressions of that religion. So in Judaism, that's that you know that's the same with Judaism. So there's a number of different groups that we're going to run into as we're going through the New Testament. And let's go over those a little bit. So the Sadducees. So the Sadducees were the Levite priests who operated in the temple. So when we talk about the Levitical priests or the Sadducees, these are the people who were running the temple day in and day out, doing all of that temple work. Um, interesting enough, they did not believe in the resurrection and were very skeptical of anything supernatural. How does that compare to some of our modern day church denominations? Interesting, huh? So the Sadducees were the religious elite, all right? They were the people in charge of the temple, but no resurrection and anything supernatural probably didn't happen. The Pharisees, on the other hand, these were the Jewish fundamentalists. They believed in the strict letter of the law. They did believe in the resurrection. They totally believed in supernatural things. They were more of the people. Okay? So the, the, the Pharisees in the New Testament get a kind of a bad rap. They were really important people to the development of the Judaism that Jesus, Jesus would be walking into. Um, for good or for bad. In a lot of ways, there was a lot of good that the Pharisees did. They, they identified the Jewish people as Jewish, and that's what the law is all about. And strict adherence to the law was that, that fear of losing your Jewish identity. Um, the one thing the Pharisees took very, very seriously was exile. And that it was the idolatry and the disobedience of the Jewish people that led to their exile. Now, did they take it too far? <laughs> totally. The strict adherence to the law was 
so important to the Pharisees because they saw that the survival of the Jewish people depended on it. So you have the Pharisees. Now, then you have another group of people called the Essenes. The Essenes, this was the mystics. These guys were out on the western edge of the Dead Sea in the Qumran area. They believe the current temple leaders and the procedures done in the temple were completely corrupt and had to be replaced with those who followed the Torah. All right. So um, the Essenes, they sort of went out. They did a lot of scribe work. They were amazing for their scribe work. And they would meticulously copy the Jewish scriptures. So how meticulous did they do it? Well, if an Essene was writing out his script and he'd be going word for word, word for word, following along, when he came to the word Yahweh, and I think I've told this story, when he came to the word Yahweh, he would break his pen, throw out his ink, he would go take a cleansing bath called a mikvah, get new ink, new pen, and write the word Yahweh and keep going until he hit the next Yahweh. The Essenes were very, very strict people. They were very mystical, but they did a tremendous amount of scribe work. And I'll tell you the story at some point in this series of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is a discovery of all of their work, all of their scribe work. Um, so the Dead Sea Scrolls come from the Essenes, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the scribes. So, this, so we have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes. Those are the main religious groups. But we also have the scribes. And these are the religious lawyers. So you have 613 laws spelled out in the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, you need lawyers to decide, okay, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Well, if my donkey falls into a pit, Am I allowed to bring that donkey out of the pit on the Sabbath or do I have to wait till the next day to bring him out? You know, that's what the lawyers were there for, the scribes. So the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees worked together to decide, you know, what this law looked like. And then you had the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the main religious group that was everybody, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, but the Essenes, the Essenes wanted nothing to do with the, with the Sanhedrin. The primary, this was the primary leadership group for the Jewish people, the Jewish religion, religion in Israel. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Jews in the New Testament. Now, when we read the New Testament, we read a lot, an awful lot where they mention generic the Jews. I love how John Gober spells it out, J-O-O-O-O-O-O-Z, the Jews. And I think that's, a, that's kind of an improper reading of that. I think Judean is often a much better reading because there was a much, there, there was a different aspect between the Judean Jewish leadership and Jewish leadership outside of Jerusalem. Okay, so in reading the Bible and you come upon the Jews, think Judean. Judean uh, Judaism was far more fundamentalist than the northern Galilean region, for example. Galileans, by and large, did not have a problem, for example, with the Sar Samaritan people, whereas the Judean Jews did. They saw them as half-breed people that were imported by the other empires and uh, where you know, the, the Samaritan people worshipped uh, kind of a pagan god as well as the Yahweh god, you know, hitting all their bases there. Um, so the Judean Jews viewed that entire territory and the Samaritan people as, um, as dirty, as unclean. And if you had any connection with a Samaritan person, you're unclean. Galileans didn't have that. They did lots of trade with the Samaritan people. They're, they were in and out of Samaria all the time. 
um, Galileans would go to would go to Jerusalem through Samaria, except for the point if they were found out that they went through Samaria, then the Judeans would have a really hard time with them. So everybody tended to go around Samaria, but the Galileans didn't really have a problem with the people. Um, they did routinely engage with commercial enterprise with the Samaritan people. So the Judean Jews, very fundamentalist, whereas the Galilean Jewish people, not so much, not so much. And here is where we're entering the New Testament, the entire New Testament. So the whole New Testament was written somewhere between 50 AD and 95 AD. The whole thing was written during that time, very short amount of time. Think of how long it took to get the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures written, millennia, thousands of years. But here we have about 45 years that the whole New Testament is being written. The books of John were probably the last one. Um, the book of First Thess Thessalonians, Galatians, or maybe even the Passion narrative in Mark, these could be the first writings um, or the earliest writings. Now, here's an interesting fact that lends a lot of credence to the New Testament being written during this time period between 50 and 95. 90%, 90% of the New Testament is quoted by the early church fathers. That means between 90 and 220 AD, 90% of the scriptures are, are quoted. Many books of the New Testament were in dispute. So, like James. James was in dispute because he really doesn't talk about Jesus at all, even though Jesus is all over James when you, when you read through it. The name Jesus doesn't really come up. Hebrews, because we don't know who the author is. So Hebrews was called in the question. Second Corinthians, because it seems kind of disjointed. Was it really written by Paul or not? Um, I think it was written by Paul. It was just scribed by a different person using different vocabulary. Um, so a lot of the books were in dispute, but really when you held to three different or four different principles, you could come to a conclusion of what was canon, what wasn't canon. And what I mean by canon is those books that are accepted as New Testament books. Those four principles. The first one is, did an apostle write it? Or somebody close to an apostle? That, that, that was an important thing. That's what made Hebrews. Who was it that wrote Hebrews? We don't know. But he was obviously close to the apostles. When you read through Hebrews, he was close to the apostles because that same teaching is all throughout the New Testament. Can the authorship be agreed upon? Uh, Hebrews, no. But the rest of the New Testament, yeah, pretty much. There's some squabbles here and there. Uh, is the content consistent with the historical foundations of the faith? Now, this is where the, um, the Gnostic Gospels get tossed because they're garbage. They're, they just have, like the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Judas, all of these... Uh, or the God, I think there's a Gospel of Peter too. That they, they all contradict what the New Testament is talking about. They were also written much, much, much later, um, well into the uh, second and third century A.D. Uh, so they would have no connection with the disciples at all. Um, and was it written during the period of the disciples? That's the important part. So when you largely adhere to those four principles, you get the New Testament canon. So the canon, the authority of what is and what is not in the New Testament was assembled by the church, by the bishops in Hippo in 393 AD, and then in Carthage in 397 AD, it was ratified. They confirmed what they already knew to be true. So... If you've ever read Dan Brown and uh, his uh, Da Vinci Code, um, it's a fabulous story, but historically, it's hot garbage. It really is. The, uh, Dan Brown makes the assumption, or the uh, he, he, he says that it was the Council of Nicaea that decided scripture, and he's 100% historically false. 
Uh, it was in 397 AD that it was ratified, but they were ratifying things they already knew to be true, and you can read that in the church fathers. Okay, 90% of those church fathers, 90% of the New Testament is quoted. So, this brings us to the Gospels. And we're gonna, that's where we're going to start in the New Testament, with, with the Gospels. All right, so commonalities of the Gospels. There are some differences, but there are a lot of commonalities. Um, commonalities of the Gospel, ministry, begins in, ministry of Jesus begins in Galilee. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000, that's in all of the Gospels. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, that's in all the Gospels. Foretells Judas's betrayal, Peter denying Jesus, Pilate pronouncing sentence on Jesus, Jesus's crucifixion, Jesus's death, his burial, and his resurrection, and Mary and the other woman, women seeing Jesus. All of that is in the four Gospels. But why are there four Gospels? Well, different perspectives provide complementary insights. Okay, so one of my favorite apologists is named J. Werner Wallace, and he tells a story about the hardest case he had to prove and the easiest case he had to prove. The hardest case he had to prove um, was, his, was his first one, and he was called out, and it was a homicide, and it was a cold night, and the patrolman who was there had four witnesses and he thought that it would be very nice of him to take those four witnesses and put them all together in one car uh, and turn the heat on. Wasn't that nice of him? Well, that made Wallace's job harder. Why? Because what did they do? They talked about their story. They all agreed upon the same story. And they all came out with a different story. So that actually became a really tough case to prove because you tend to be more suspicious when everybody's telling the exact same story. The, heart of, the easiest case that Wallace was able to prove came when um, uh, during a robbery. Okay, So there were two witnesses to this robbery. The first witness was asked, okay, was he wearing a t-shirt? And uh, one witness said, yeah, it was a blue t-shirt. And uh, another witness said, no, it was a light beige Izod collared shirt. Hmm. And uh, they were, he was also asked, uh, they were also asked, did he have facial hair? One said no. The other one said yes. Uh, did he have a gun? One said no. The other said yes. Uh, did he produce a note? No. One said no. One said yes. Um... And, and on and on, there were a bunch of disparities. Well, how did this become the easiest one? Because it was determined that one person was facing, it was the clerk, facing the, uh, the, 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 whole, the, the suspect. And he could see the gun. He could see the note. He could see the facial hair. He wasn't paying a lot of attention to what he was wearing. And then the other person, the other witness, was standing behind the suspect. So when you put the two stories together, it made sense. Think about it in your own case. Let's say you're, uh, you witness an auto accident and you're a cop and you're talking to all the witnesses. Are you more suspicious or less suspicious if everybody is telling the exact same story? And that's really the, the point of having four Gospels. You're having four different points of view, four different ways of looking at this story of Jesus. And that's where we're going to leave it for today. That introduces us to the New Testament. That makes us ready to jump into the Gospels. So until next week, um, if you like, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, please like and subscribe. Um, Put a comment below, share the videos, send me an email at wanderingwesleyan at uh, hotmail.com. And until next week, God bless.